morning. Um, it is 5 a.m. and I'm feeling a lot worse than I normally do when I wake up at 5 a.m. And it's not because I didn't have enough sleep because I still got eight hours of sleep last night. Let me explain why. <laughs> So that clip that you just saw was actually filmed two weeks ago and the reason why I got bad sleep despite sleeping eight hours and the exercise I was doing is due to the same reason. I have a small problem with my shoulder called a slap lesion. Let me explain what that is. Okay, so before I can start and go ahead and describe the anatomy of the shoulder, there are some terms within medicine that are very important for us to understand. Because in medicine, it's important to be able to describe things very accurately and precisely in order for other professionals to understand which part of the body you were referring to. When describing human anatomy, you have to be able to orientate yourself. So on this left-hand side, we have a top-down view of the person. This person is looking this way. This is their front part. And in medicine, the front is described as the anterior part. And the back of the person is described as the posterior part. This line is referred to as the midline. When someone is cut down this midline, they will be turned into two very equal and symmetrical bits. Things that are closer to this midline are referred to as medial. And things that are further away on either side are described as lateral. For this side profile of this person, again, we can say that the front part is known as anterior and the back is known as the posterior part. And there is also the need to describe something that is above or below something. When we say the head is above the feet, we call it superior. And when we say the feet is below to the head, we call it inferior. For example, the feet is inferior to the head. Now, these terms are very important because, as you can tell, the name of my shoulder problem already includes many of these terms. So it's important that we first establish what these terms mean. Now, what we're looking at here is an anterior view of the right shoulder. Anterior view means we are standing anterior to this person, meaning we are standing in front of the person and we are looking back to the front part of this person. Now this is the right shoulder. This is the right upper arm. This is the right chest. And this is the, there are mainly two bones involved in the shoulder joint. This big one right here, this triangular shaped wedge is called the scapula. This long bone that forms our upper arm is known as the humerus. Okay, sorry, there was a typo. And when we're referring to this roundish part at the end of the humerus, we call this the proximal head. Proximal because it is closer to the center of the body, closer than the other end. The other end is known as the distal end because it's further away. So we call this the proximal head of the humerus. This bit of bone sticking out is known as the coracoid process. The bit of the scapula this curvy bit, which actually touches the proximal head of the humerus, is known as the glenoid. And this little bone on the top is known as the clavicle. It is not directly involved in the movement of the shoulder joint, but it also still plays a role in maintaining stability on this side of the body. Now we are looking at the lateral view of the scapula, meaning we are looking at the shoulder from the side without the long bone, which is called the humerus that we had earlier. We are looking at it from the side. All of these different features are all part of the scapula, which is one bone. Now, this skinny bit down here is part of the big triangle we saw from the anterior view. But when you look at it from the side, it is actually very skinny and very thin. The glenoid is this big oval shaped or pear shaped surface that was part of the curved region of the scapula that interacts or touches the proximal head of the humerus as seen in the anterior view. 
What you can't see the anterior view is the acromion. The acromion is lies on the posterior side of the scapula and has a, quite a few muscles and ligaments attached to it that help to stabilize and move the shoulder joint. So this is the acromion. Around the glenoid, there is two little bulges. One is called the infraglenoid tubercle. Infra is similar to inferior, meaning it is below it. And one is called the supraglenoid tubercle because it is above it. Again, this is the choroid process. Now, if we just imagine for a second that we are looking at the anterior view of the shoulder, this curve will be the glenoid surface, which interacts with, this is the humerus, and my fist will be the proximal head of the humerus. The glenoid interacts with the proximal head of the humerus, just like the drawing of the anterior view of the shoulder. Now, this is known as a ball and socket joint. Why? because my fist looks like a ball and this curvature formed by the glenoid looks like a socket which this ball inserts into. This type of joint allows your upper arm to move in any direction that it wants without falling out and causing a dislocation. But in reality, this ball and socket joint is not as deep as my right hand makes it look to be because right now it looks like my right hand is very well curved which is, seems like it is holding this proximal head very well and not allowing it to dislocate. In reality, the glenoid is actually very shallow. Imagine this being the proximal head of the humerus. The humerus is not very well covered by the curvature of the glenoid. This humeral head can actually very easily fall out if it just relies on this little indent formed by the curvature of the glenoid to hold it still. So just to illustrate again, in this diagram, this glenoid forms a very deep pocket for the humeral head to actually insert into, um, which seems to be able to really grab hold of the humeral head and not let it slip out. But in reality, the glenoid is much shallower and much smaller than we think it is, even though it's called a bone socket joint, meaning that this head is not fixed onto the glenoid very well. Therefore, it can slip out on either direction very easily. Now this is where a structure called the labrum comes in to help stabilize the head of the humerus. Around this glenoid there is a piece of fibrocartilaginous tissue which is similar to a ligament that surrounds the perimeter of this glenoid surface. So this labrum includes this whole ring of fibrous tissue that surrounds the surface of the glenoid. We move on to the anterior view of the shoulder. By forming this deep ring around the, the edge of the glenoid, it is actually wrapping around more of the surface of the proximal head of the humerus and thereby not allowing it to slip out as easily because now it has more surface area uh, that is actually deep into the joint. Now there are two more structures that are part of my shoulder prop that I would like to reiterate. First is the supraglenoid tubercle, which again sits just above the top end of the glenoid. And you can see it on both of these lateral and anterior views. And then there is also the choroid cord process, which is this bit of bone sticking out. And you can see it on both sides as well. Now what I've drawn here is a muscle called the biceps brachii. And a lot of us know what this muscle is, it's the biceps. Now the reason it's called the biceps is because bi means two, and this big muscle it has actually two smaller subgroups within it, known as the long head of the bicep and the short head of the bicep. Now, as we know, the bicep actually extends down the arm, but when it extends upwards, it splits into the short head and the long head. The long head actually extends all the way to the supraglenoid tubercle mentioned earlier, and the short head extends all the way to the choroid process. And we look on this lateral view, the same thing is happening here, where the long head of the bicep is attaching to the supraglenoid tubercle and the short head is attaching to the choroid process. Now, when your muscle attaches to a piece of bone, it requires an intermediate bit of tissue known as a tendon. Now, the tendon of the long head of the bicep is actually continuous with this labrum. So therefore, any trauma to this long head of the bicep can actually also damage the attachment of the labrum to the glenoid surface. As we know, the slap lesion stands for superior labrum anterior posterior. In the slap lesion, it is the area where the long head of the bicep inserts onto the labrum that is the focus of the, the damage. Superior labrum is referring to the top part of the labrum. Anterior posterior refers to the bit of the labrum that is anterior and posterior to the site at which 
this long head of the bicep inserts too. So this whole region is damaged or weakened because of many different causes. And when that happens, this can cause irritation and pain and potentially complications when the superior end of this labrum is under too much stress. It can potentially detach from the glenoid surface as you can see here, and this will increase the instability of this scapulohumeral joint a lot because now depth that was once provided by this labrum for this joint no longer exists. Of course, you have other things, other structures that help stabilize this joint, but it might be too in-depth trying to explain that at the moment. So to better explain how to detect this sort of condition clinically and to understand the mechanics of this problem, um, I've drawn the biceps brachii on my affected shoulder. But before I explain, I'd like to explain a few concepts that will help us um, understand uh, what type of movement I'm describing. So when my arm is going anteriorly and going up, this is known as flexing the shoulder joint. And when it's going backwards, this is called extension of the shoulder joint. When my arm goes to my left and goes further away from me, going upwards, this is called abduction. And when it comes down and perhaps even over to this side, this is called adduction. The shoulder can also rotate. There is internal rotation when my arm is ro rotating inwards and there is external rotation when my arm is rotating that way externally. So firstly, to describe the biceps brachii muscle on my arm, it is called biceps again because it has two proximal heads. Um, there is the short head and the long head. The short head again is a slightly shorter and it inserts, which means attaches to the coracoid process of my scapula. The long head goes slightly further and deeper to the supraglenoid tubercle above the glenoid surface of my scapula as well. So both of these heads are attached to my scapula. On the distal side, this is the proximal side, further away is distal. On the distal side, my biceps are attached to the radius. The radius is one of two bones on your forearm and the area which it attaches to is called the radial tuberosity. So as we know, the biceps are what we use when we try to flex. So if you can imagine, when this muscle contracts and shortens, it will pull my forearm upwards, causing my elbow to flex. And that's why um, everyone wants to work on the biceps when they want to look big. So the biceps brachii muscle doesn't just help with flexing the arm. It also helps with flexing the shoulder. The reason why is because it's actually attached to the scapula as well, meaning that when it contracts, it can actually pull my upper arm closer to my scapula. This means that it will cause the shoulder to flex in this manner because it's pulling it upwards. Now, like I said, in a slap lesion, the bit that's affected is the superior part of the labrum. This is where the long head of the bicep attaches to. So this is where my injury is. And the most common type of trauma for this to happen in is when people fall to their sides, usually in this abducted position, and when I fall onto uh, the floor or a wall, the force that is exerted through my arm causes my arm to be pushed this way because the force is coming this way. When this happens, this bicep insertion into the supraglenoid tubercle can actually be damaged because if you can imagine, the long head of the bicep attaches to the glenoid surface normally. And when a force is exerted up the arm, and in the abducted position, it can cause the long head of the biceps to be pushed this way in a very short period of time um, with a large amount of force and can actually damage this connection and also might potentially cause the superior part of the labrum to be pushed upwards as well and detach from the glenoid. Hence, this is called a snap lesion. Now, clinically, the best test to be able to test for this thing without doing um, any MRIs or anything is something called the O'Brien's test. The O'Brien's test involves me first flexing the shoulder, adducting it, which means bringing it closer to me, and then internally rotating my upper arm. And when I'm in this position, the long head of the bicep, as you can tell, is playing a very important role of contracting and um, helping me stabilize my shoulder in, sp in this position rather than relaxing and allowing my shoulder to drop downwards. So in this O'Brien's test, if someone were to exert a downwards force onto my arm, because this area of the bicep and the bicep tendon and the superior labrum is injured, this part won't function as well and it will be weaker, meaning that my arm will give easily and fall 
with a slight amount of resistance that's pushing downwards. And the second part of O'Brien's test is when I externally rotate the arm. And in this case, the long head of the bicep is no longer the only part of the bicep that's helping with this position but the short head of the bicep is also helping to stabilize my arm and shoulder in this position. And in this position, if someone were to push downwards on my arm this way, my arm would be able to resist a stronger downwards force before it would fail and start falling downwards because I have now have the help of my short head of the bicep. So for this type of condition, uh, physiotherapy is one of the mainstays for treatment, especially because I have a very early form of this sort of problem. And what it involves is having this elastic band attached to somewhere on the floor. Um, and in this exercise, I first have to use my uh, other arm, my strong arm, to help pull this left arm upwards. And that's when the resistance in this band increases. And I am supposed to slowly eccentrically uh, contract and allow this band to shorten and by doing so actually training this part of the arm to slowly regain its strength. There are also a lot of other exercises that I'm supposed to do with this band but the key idea here is, is being able to retrain this part of the bicep in order to help it regain its strength as well as to train the rest of the muscles surrounding the shoulder joint in order to provide it with more stability and allow whatever is injured to, to recover better if I have other muscles that can help stabilize it as well. Um, so thank you for watching the end of the video. Um, now to explain why I had bad sleep that night, it's because for a few years now, I've been sleeping with my body turning and leaning on my right shoulder, which I think has aggravated an uh, existing lesion that is already in there, which I think is due to poor posture when I did some gym pull-up exercises. Having spoken to my physiotherapist, I was told from now on to sleep with my back flat, um, which has very unnatural to me because for years I am now used to sleeping on that left side of my shoulder. That is why I ended up having such a bad night's sleep. That was one of the first few days since I started sleeping completely flat, or if, if not the first day. It's already been two weeks, but still sleeping fat is not the most comfortable position for me, but it will probably just take a bit more time for me to get used to. I would also like to make another disclaimer that the information in this video is not 100% accurate or correct. There may be parts where I got it wrong. I just followed some medical textbooks in terms of how they explained the problem and also just looked at the anatomy and tried to figure out some things on my own. So don't take all the knowledge from this video to be completely true. Thank you for watching.